Happy March 1st. Can't believe that we're at that point in the calendar. And we're almost three quarters of the way through the school year. So congratulations on that. It's been a wonderful year. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity together to worship and to hear from your servant, Ryan, this morning. We give thanks for the staff and teachers at this school, for our student body, our families. We ask your continued blessing. Keep us safe. Keep us whole. And Lord, this morning as we worship together, we give thanks for revival around this nation and the young people in our national community, Lord. We thank you for your presence here in our school, and we look forward to seeing what you have in store for each of us today and through the remainder of this school year. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah, thanks. 
everybody. I want to share a bit about our next song and a line that stands out to me. It says, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. And this really shows that God is so powerful and has blessed us with so much that we should take everything in us and offer it to him. Every breath, every praise, every day of our lives. Let's reflect on that as we continue in worship together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside.
Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the wonderful opportunity to gather together and worship you. And thank you for your everlasting blessings. Please let what the chapel speaker has to say give us the encouragement to finish this week out strong. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Patriot Praise. Well, we're very excited and pleased to welcome Ryan Dobson to our chapel program this morning. <clears throat> Ryan has authored six books, and he hosts, along with his wife, Laura, uh, an iTunes Top 20 podcast on parenting called Rebel Parenting. Uh, Ryan's also the son of Focus on the Family founder, Dr. James Dobson, all the way from Colorado Springs. Let's welcome Ryan Dobson. Hello. Oh, fantastic. How are you guys doing? Woo! Most high school and middle school, junior high kids don't say that. Most are like, woo. I've had the best, best morning. I've been looking forward to this day for months. I am so, so honored to be here. Ah, my goodness. Thank you for having me. Oh, really? Wow. You got one special school. I can already tell. Okay, two things I'm going to try to convey in my time here. One is that you can always rely on God in any situation. I know you've heard that before, but I want to talk about it in a different way. And the second thing is I want you to experience God's love in a brand new way that you've never experienced it before. I want you to see him and how he loves you in a brand new way so you can leave here and think about that. You have a Bible class? Yeah. And you go to it regularly? Yeah. Well, let's dive in. And Jesus said unto his disciples, go forth into the world teaching all men to live any way they choose urging each to find his or her own path to God. Let not any one of you make someone feel inferior or victimized because of their beliefs, but above all, be tolerant. Verily, verily, I say unto you that what you believe and how you live don't matter just as long as you're sincere. Leaving that place, Jesus led his disciples to the upper room. They broke bread, and he addressed them, saying, I am one of the ways. I am one of the truths. I am one possible life. If you choose to get to the father or mother, if you prefer, through me, that's cool. And there was much rejoicing. Boy, it got quiet in here. You're trying to figure out if I believe this or not, right? This is not what you're being taught? That's not in your Bible? No, it's not. But most of the world lives that way every single day. Have you seen the world around you? All of a sudden now we have your truth and my truth. And your truth is different from my truth, but your truth is correct. And my truth is too, even if we disagree. I can feel something about myself, and if I feel it, it must be true, right? People say, oh, it's good that you speak your truth. Here's what I'm here to tell you. You don't have truth. Neither do I. You can discover truth, but you can't make it up. It was a bunch of years ago. I was on an airplane. I was trying to fly to a speaking event, and flights were being canceled, and it took me all over the country. I ended up on seven flights to try to get to one place. It took 16 hours to get there, and the whole time I'm like, goodness gracious, Lord, what is going on? I gotta work. I gotta get to this place. I gotta go talk about you. Why are you doing this to me? And Lord, oh, it, the flights are awful, you know? It's just bleh. And I don't like sitting next to people on the flights because they're people, why? I love it when there's like a three row and I get the aisle and then there's nobody in the middle and then maybe there'll be somebody against the window. I don't care about that guy. But before he gets down, I stick my bag under the middle seat and then I got the full leg room and I'm like, yeah. So I had that going on and uh, this kid came and sat against the window and I was like, good, don't bother me. I won't bother you. I'm not going to talk. And uh, I put my bag in the middle and I'm stretching out and I'm having a good time. And they start the tray. They're bringing the food down the aisle on an airplane. It's not real food. It's like F-U-D with a line over it, but it pretends to be food. So they're going, chicken or beef, chicken or beef, the whole thing. And they get to me and she's like, chicken or beef? And I was like, surprise me. I bet I can't tell which one is which, you know? And she put something covered in gravy in front of me that was salty. I don't know what it was. And the guy against the window, he goes, oh, do you have a vegetarian meal? And she goes, we do. And I was like, you do? Why? Oh, for guys like this. Now, I don't care what you eat. I don't care if you're keto. I don't care if you're intermittent fast. I don't care if you never eat an egg. But I am curious. And if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, I just want to figure out why. 
I was in a chapel just like this, and a kid came up to me afterwards. He goes, I'm a vegetarian. I go, really? He goes, you want to know why? And I go, 100%. He goes, out of spite. I was like, excuse me? He goes, yep. I was in a big fight with my mom. She was like, you're going to clean your room. And I was like, no, I'm not. And she goes, yes, you are. I'm going to make you. And he goes, if you do, I'll be a vegetarian. I was like, hey, dude, you lost that fight. Did you clean your room? And he's like, yes. I'm like, and you don't eat bacon anymore? And he's like, yes. I'm like, woo, you really did lose. So a guy was a vegetarian meal, and I have to ask. I'm like, hey, man, are you really vegetarian? Like, maybe he just orders real food on an airplane, because it looked like real food. It wasn't like the FUD stuff that I got. And he's like, oh, no, no, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. And I was like, seriously, how long has it been? Like, it's present or something, because, you know, it kind of feels like that, I guess. And he goes, 10 years. And I was like, 10 years? Whoa, that's a long time. And I go, can I ask you why? And he goes, oh, yeah, deadpan, looks me in the eyes. He goes, animals are my friends, and I don't want to eat my friends. Okay, I normally don't talk to people on airplanes, but brother, I'm talking to you the whole flight. This is the best. Oh my goodness, I asked a million questions. I wanna know everything about, I found out so many things. He lives on a houseboat. I'm like, you live on a houseboat? What's it like when there's like stormy seas? Like you have to strap yourself in? And he's like, no, no, we kinda of live in a harbor. I'm like, that's a terrible story. You should change it for sure. I'm like, you gotta talk about like plates falling off and you gotta glue stuff down. And, That'd be a better story. And he lives with roommates, and he was having troubles with them, and all these things. Something happened. It wasn't about he or I, but something was taking place. And I'm like, oh, man, that's wrong. Can you believe that? That's just so wrong. He said something I had never heard, and I've never heard since. I've heard about this, but it's kind of like a unicorn. You hear about them, but you never see one, right? He looked at me, and he goes, oh, Ryan, I don't believe in truth. I'm like, excuse me? He goes, yeah, I don't believe in truth. I go, what does that mean? He goes, I don't think it exists. I think I have a truth and you have a truth and we can have our own beliefs and we can get along and you can always compromise. I was like, wow, can I ask you questions about that? And he goes, sure. That's the thing. If you don't want to offend somebody, if you don't understand their belief system, just ask them questions. Why? How? How'd you come to this belief? Where'd you find the evidence for it? What do you feel when you believe these things? And I was asking him, you know, like, oh, well, um, I'm adopted. So I was adopted when I was six weeks old. Uh, I've met my bio mom, and it's amazing. She was 16 when she got pregnant with me, and she was going to keep me, and her parents were gonna help her, and a month before I was born, she flipped her VW van on the freeway and then decided maybe I'm not the best mom at 16, and so I was adopted. So I am huge. I speak at pro-life events all the time. I love talking about it, and I was like, so, how do you feel about abortion? He's like, oh, well, it's a woman's body, and it's her choice, and I don't want to tell a woman what she can or can't do with her body, and it's her choice, and if I do, I'm going to offend and oppress her, and I don't want to offend and oppress anybody, so I can't tell her what to do. And I was like, okay. And, you know, I'm trying to ease into the situation, like just kind of get your toe wet a little bit, and I was like, so what do you feel about Hitler? Because <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> I'm more like, woo, cannonball, you know, just jump in, splash, just get awkward, let's do it. And I was like, so how do you feel about Hitler? And he goes, why does everybody bring up Hitler? because he was a bad guy? <laughs> Why? Of course they bring him up. And he's like, well, I hope nobody would ever do what he did, but why am I in a position to tell somebody what they can or can't do with their life? Why am I in a position to tell someone what their destiny is? And, you know, I don't want to tell anybody what they can or can't do in their life because that would offend them. And, and, you know, I hope nobody ever does that, but I can't tell somebody what they can or can't do. I was like, whoa, this guy's sticking to his guns. I didn't have anything else to say. I was like, I went back to eating my dumb food. I was like, mm-hmm. And I looked over, and he looked kind of down, and I was like, oh, I did it. Like, you know when you just step on it, and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. I offended this guy. I made him upset. And I don't want to do that. I like people. I like to be kind. I think Jesus wants me to be kind. And I was like, man, I am so sorry. I'm just curious. And he goes, no, 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 it's not you. It's not, I, just, I got this thing I got to do, and I don't want to do it. And I'm like, really? Because I'm just curious about your beliefs. He's like, no, no, it's not that. I just, I'm like, do you want to talk about it? One of his roommates was living with him in the houseboat that doesn't rock, and uh, he wasn't paying rent. And when he got home, he was gonna have to kick his roommate out and they had been friends for a long time and he's worried about hurting the friendship. And I was like, ooh, that is tough. And he's like, oh, I just feel awful. I'm like, yeah, you should. And he goes, what? I'm like, you should feel terrible. 
He was like, why? I go, well, your roommate has decided that for him, it's right not to pay you rent. And if you kick him out or you force him to pay rent, he's going to be offended and oppressed. And you don't want to offend or oppress anybody. So I really believe you should let him live in your place for free and you should cover the bills. And he was like, And I was like, just kidding. <laughs> and he goes, really? I'm like, nope. <laughs> I let him sit there silent, just like, the gears are like, Urgh. what do you do? And I was like, you, know, you really want to know what I believe? And he was like, okay. Truth does exist. There is a right and wrong. What he's doing is wrong. You entered into an agreement. He signed a contract agreeing to pay you money every month. If he breaks that contract, he's stealing from you. Stealing is wrong. So you should kick him out. By the way, it's the most merciful thing to do. You're explaining to him in a real-world, tangible way that you can't just stop paying bills and get along. I mean, the whole thing about you can compromise all the time. He's like, yes. I'm like, that doesn't work either. He's like, no, we can. We can always compromise. I'm like, we cannot. He's like, why would you say that? It's so mean. That's what you're going to hear. Okay? First thing you're going to hear when you start asking people questions they can't answer is you're being mean. No, you're not. Well, I mean, maybe you are. Maybe you got a nasty tone in your voice. Maybe you're looking down your nose at them. You feel like, oh, I'm so much better than you because I believe in truth. And you do. Maybe. But if you're just asking questions, it's not mean. So, still asking questions. and uh, I was like, hey, do you have your wallet on you? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, does that have money and credit cards in it? He's like, of course. I'm like, can I have half of it? And he goes, what? I'm like, yeah, I, I want half your money. And he goes, no. I'm like, well, but I want it, and I think it's right to take your money, and now you're going to offend and oppress me if you don't give it to me. Why don't we go to lunch afterwards? I'll buy. <laughs> he didn't like that one very much. I'm like, oh, well, now you've made me angry, and I've decided I'd like to shoot you. Can I? And he was like, What? I'm like, what if we compromise? I'll just shoot your pinky toe off, right? And you'll be very sad, and I will be very happy, and it'll even out, we'll compromise, it'll be great. He's like trying to hit the call button for the flight attendant, was slapping his hand away. No, that didn't happen. He was like, oh my goodness, you're a freak. And I was like, well, you know. I'm like, honestly, man, it doesn't matter what I believe. If I wake up this morning, I don't get to decide which way north is. I don't get to go, hmm, today I think it's this way. And when I wake up, the earth splits into parallel universes so everybody can be right in their own mind. Nope, you just get to be lost. I was like, it doesn't matter if I believe I can dunk a basketball. I am old and white and I cannot. <laughs> it does not matter what my belief system is. I will never touch the rim without a ladder. We talked the entire flight. I would love to tell you that by the end of the flight, the flight attendants and I were laying hands on him and he accepted the Lord. That did not happen. But I planted a seed in him. And as we were sitting there, he goes, you know what? I don't know if I consciously believe in right and wrong, but maybe subconsciously I do. And I was like, awesome. Good for you. Can you imagine what a terrifying place that would be? He's got to decide if everything he holds to be true is wrong. How do you behave going forward? You now believe in rules and laws that they should govern your life? That's terrifying. But it was the seed, right? It's so interesting. We read that verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And what we think of is all the great things we can do through Christ who strengthens me, right? That's what we're thinking about. Oh, I can do great things, anything. I can do all things. Sometimes that means getting through your worst days. Sometimes that's what Christ strengthens you to do. Do you know you've lasted through 100% of every one of your worst days? Isn't that crazy? Think about that. Think about the worst things that have happened to you. I mean, would you have asked for it? Of course not. If somebody told you you're going to have to go through it, you'd be like, oh, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do that. I can't do that. And then you get in the situation. Like, I got married, and I am a little crazy. So I met my wife on a blind date. We talked on the phone a couple times, but the heavens didn't open. The angels didn't sing. It was like, you know, we talked, whatever. But we met on a blind date, and I looked at her, and I was like, oh, no, I'm going to marry you, and I don't know how to tell you. 
Like that instant, it was like, ah. So because I'm patient, I waited three weeks to ask her to marry me. <laughs> I met with her dad two weeks in, and I was like, uh, sir, I have fallen in love with your daughter, and I would like to marry her. And he goes, well, it took you long enough. That was his way of welcoming into the family after two weeks, which was very, very cool. Mm. Where was I going with that? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Stop. I'm going to get it. No, I'm not. Doesn't matter. So, let's talk about scary. Everybody been through a scary situation? Everybody been afraid or scared? Just a few of you, right? Not everybody, of course. Think about really scared, really scared. The whole world went through a time that we thought was scary, right? The whole world got scared for a while. We all went indoors and shut our doors because we were all scared for a while. That was tough. It was harder on you than it was on us as adults. It was so much harder on you than it was for us as adults, right? But we got through it. I never was talking about my wife. Love my wife. We got married uh, five months and a day after I asked her to marry me. So on our wedding day, we hadn't known each other six months yet. And we've now been married for almost 18 years. We've got two kids, and it is the greatest thing in the world. But when I was standing there, I, we got married on the beach in Newport Beach on my brother-in-law's house, and it was illegal, so it was just me and Laura and the pastor on the sand. So we were only ones breaking the law, and then we had like a, some friends on the grass like right here. And Oh, my goodness. She was so pretty. She still is, but I mean, you know. Like, your wedding, it was, a ma it was just the most magical day. Like, we didn't plan anything. Like, I don't know. Like, what's a wedding, right? Like, what do you, uh, flowers, colors, all the things? I don't know. And she didn't either. And so our friends all pitched in, and then we showed up on that day, and it was like, whoa, look what you did. It was amazing. My nephews were pro surfers, and uh, when, we, when we walked back from the aisle, they, all the bridesmaids were holding uh, their surfboards, went through a tunnel of surfboards. Uh, she walked down the aisle to the Beach Boys surfer girl. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. There's about a 100% chance I will cry at some point. So if you're uncomfortable with emotions, woo, it's going to be rough for you. It was the most magical day. We walked back uh, to uh, the Beatles, All You Need Is Love. Oh, it was just awesome. And on that day, all I thought of were the amazing, amazing things we'd get to do for the rest of our lives. All I thought of was the adventures that we would have, and maybe we'd have children, and what would they be like, and we would grow old together. I never thought of one negative thing on that day. I never dreamed of the future and realized I'd have to go through cancer with my wife. It did not occur to me on that day that we would go through cancer. And if you had asked me, hey, could you survive if your wife has a bout of cancer? Like, what? No, 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 don't. Uh-uh. Uh, but I did. Whew. Was it easy? No. It's terrible. Cancer's the worst. Woo, it's so bad. Oh, my goodness. And by the way, this is, you don't understand this yet, but you will someday. When you're a husband or you're a wife and you watch your spouse suffer and you can't do anything about it, whew. oh, it's awful, especially for a man. Women, you got to understand this. You have so much power. You have so much power that you don't even understand that you have. A man will do literally anything for you. Anything. Your husband will literally jump in front of a train for you if you love him. If you show that you love him. If you say kind things to him. Men are starved for kindness. We live in a world that says you are wrong because you were born a man. You're toxic. There's a part of you that's toxic to the whole society. It's damaging the whole society. No, it's not. No, it's not. Listen, there's no such thing as tox toxic masculinity. There are such a thing as toxic males. The masculinity, it's why we're all alive today. It's why we're not under German rule. It's the truth. It's only because of testosterone in boys. I'm telling you the truth. You gotta understand, go talk to those people that have been in wars. You know, they said, oh, I've got a family in the United States. I'm gonna go die because I want them to be safe. That's what boys do, that's what men do. My wife was diagnosed with cancer. <sighs> Ugh. She had to have facial reconstructive surgery. 
I mean, ladies, honestly, how would you feel, right? She had 150 stitches on her face. How are you gonna look when it's over? How are you gonna feel when it's over? What are people gonna, what's the look on their faces when they see you for the first time? Are they gonna go, you know, they're gonna try to hide it? Oh, oh, it's, oh, oh. Just that pain. I never imagined I could go through it. And here's the truth. Was the Lord with me every step of the way? Yeah, totally, every step of the way, always. Every step of the way, his arms were around me the entire time. Did I feel it? Uh Uh-uh. No, I did not. I felt scared. I felt sad. I felt angry, but I did not feel God hugging me. And it was me, not him. Do you know that God can't love you any more than he does? He also can't love you any less than he does. It's the craziest thing in the world. He loves you more than is comprehensible. He died for you. I don't understand that. It makes no sense to me because I have kids. I've got children. I got a 16-year-old. Oh, my goodness. He is the greatest. If a decision had to be made, all of you die or Lincoln. (laughs) I'm so sorry. You're all dead. I would never think twice about it. I wouldn't even break a sweat. I probably wouldn't feel that bad. I love my kids so much. I don't even know you. I don't. I don't know you. Shauna shocking, right? Wait till you're a parent. There is nothing, nothing you won't do for a kid. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we went through cancer three times. Yeah. None of them for me, which totally stinks. I was like, Lord, seriously, it's totally okay to dump it here. It's totally okay not to do it to her anymore. That wasn't his decision. There were so many times I would go in my garage and I would weep so my kids wouldn't see me. And I would tell the Lord, I know you're here. Lord, I know you're here. But why can't I feel you? Please, God, please let me feel you. Most of the time, I'd leave without feeling anything. Does it mean he wasn't there? Nope. Never. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. It's just me that didn't feel him, and that's okay. And that's where the journey from the head to the heart is the longest. Because you've got to tell your heart sometimes when you're so sad and you think you can't last one more day. My therapist said, just go back to what you know to be true. John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In those moments, I would say, I know the Lord loves me. I know he died for me. I know it doesn't make any sense to me. I know he has a plan to prosper me. I know he died and he created a giant house and he's preparing a place for me in heaven. I know this to be true. I know this to be true. And it would get me through the next minute. And then the next hour. And then I'd go and be with my kids again. God, I was so terrible. That was just one thing, by the way. That's just one thing. We've been through so much crazy stuff. Do you know what I found out? The Lord was there every single time. So I went to a Bible study. I just joined a brand new Bible study three weeks ago. And I grew up in a really, 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 really conservative church. I mean, so conservative. We never talked about the fruits of the Spirit. We never talked about the Spirit. Ever. I saw one person speak in tongues one time my entire childhood. We were in church. My cousin, my dad's cousin was the pastor, giant mega church, and a guy stood up right over here, and he starts speaking in tongues. And I was up on the balcony, and I was like, what is going on? This is, like 15 seconds, he stood up, and I don't know what he said, because it was in tongues. And then he sat down, and the pastor took a beat, and another beat, and he went straight back into the sermon. And I was like, hey, did we all see something? I was raised so conservative. But I know the Lord is there every single step of the way. Oh, my goodness. So when I started off, I got married, right? And it was amazing, except that I was a really bad husband. I didn't know it until we had our first child. Until we had Lincoln, I didn't know how much of a bad husband or a bad father I was. I can remember the day that he was born. Oh, my gracious. Oh. It's a miracle. It's literally, a, you get to watch a miracle. When my wife got pregnant, it was a miracle. Every day was a miracle. 
Every day was a miracle. He would grow, and we would do ultrasounds, and we would hear his heartbeat, and he would, like, kick, and you'd see a footprint. He'd be like, it's like an alien in your belly. It's so crazy. You'd talk to him, and he would move. I'd be on the road, and Laura would be like, oh, and I'd go, put the phone on your belly. And she'd put the phone down here, and I'd go, Lincoln, this is your father. And she goes, he's kicking, he's kicking. Oh, my goodness. So awesome. Remember, he was born. Immediately, doctor delivers him, hands him to nurses. Like, boop, boop, that's it. Doctor's gone. Like, he's there for one thing. Catch, go. And then the nurses are cleaning him off, and they were being so rough with him. They were, like, rubbing him with cloths. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, I wanted to punch a nurse so bad. And I was so irrational. Like, we had been up for, oh, my God. I hadn't slept in days. Who knows? My wife was in labor forever, all the things. And then the nurses are just, like, roughing up my tiny baby boy. And I am just, I'm ready to just throat punch somebody. And then my rational brain was like, you know they do this for a living every day. And I was like, what? They're like, they deliver babies all day long. Maybe they know what they're doing. And I was like, oh, that's probably true. Okay. And then they did the craziest thing anybody has ever done since the beginning of time. They handed me a baby. I was like, oh no. Oh no. You, you, uh, me? No. Do you know me? Do you know what I've done? Do you know? You're going to let me be a parent. Oh no. And I, I wanted to be a good dad so bad. I was desperate in, I wanted to be a good dad so bad. Do you know what I knew on that moment? It was the most joyous time in the world and it was sad because I knew I would be a failure as a dad. The instant he was born, I knew I was going to fail. And I was terrified. I was terrified. See, most of you have just a vague idea of who my parents are. Anybody listen to Adventures in Odyssey? See, just barely any of you, and most of the people, adults that raised your head. You don't know who my parents are. You don't know who Focus on the Family really is. So, my dad started an organization in 1980 called Focus on the Family. He started it with a film series. Now, you've seen people talk on, on tape up on a screen your entire lives. He was the first person to do it. No one prior to him in 1979 had ever filmed themselves in one place to play in another place. Teaching never happened before. And it was so successful, it launched in 1980. By 1985, when I was 15, every one in three Americans had seen it. Every third person that existed in our country, a hundred million people watched it. He talked about how to be a good parent for 10 hours over a seven-part series. He talked about how to have a good marriage over that whole time. And I knew from growing up that I was the prototype, right? Because the most common thing I've ever heard in my entire life is, oh, wow, you're not what I was expecting which means you're not a small version of your dad. And I think that's wrong, and I don't like it. It's the most common thing I've ever been told is, you're not what you should be. You should be better than you are. I, I get questions like this. You wear a lot of black. What do your parents think about that? You ride a skateboard. What do your parents think about that? You have something shaved in the side of your head. What do your parents think about that? I was 12. My mom took me to get my hair cut. She told the barber what to do. What did she think about it? I guess she thinks it's okay. I wear a lot of black. What do your parents think about it? They buy all my clothes. I think they think it's okay. You ride a skateboard. What do your parents think about that? My grandmother bought it for me. But every time they said that, what they, what they were saying is, I think what you're doing is wrong. Why aren't your parents stopping you from doing it? Therefore, I knew I'm the prototype of a dad. I have to be a perfect dad. I have to. I have to be a perfect dad. And I know I'll never will be. I'll never be that. And I'm going to be a fraud, and the whole world's going to find out. Now, here's the other thing you don't know. My dad became insanely famous. Yes, 100 million Americans saw that. That sounds like a lot of numbers, right? For an entire decade, from the early 80s to the early 90s, my dad had seven of the top 10 best-selling books. The entire time for a whole decade. There were seven James Dobson books and three other randos for a decade. Everybody bought those books. Everybody bought Dare to Discipline, Strong-Willed Child, Parenting Isn't for Cowards, Bringing Up Boys, Bringing Up Girls, the list, he's written more than 80 books on the family. I'm supposed to have digested all of that information, and I'm going to be a perfect parent with my children. Oh, no. I knew I wasn't going to, and I was so afraid that I took all that fear, all that shame, all that guilt, 
and I just poured it into my children and my wife. It's just the best thing you can do, you know, just fear-based everything, set the bar way too high. Never a situation I can't make better by telling you what you did wrong and how you could do it better by doing it my way, right? I found a video of a couple years ago. I deleted it. I shouldn't have, but it's so embarrassing. I deleted it immediately. When my baby boy was born, he was, <laughs> my kid was so cute. Like you think, oh, babies are cute, right? Like everybody thinks babies are cute. Yes, my son was so cute people would reach into his car seat without thinking to touch him. Strangers. We're at the supermarket with my wife when Lincoln was an infant. Infant, you know, like you swaddle him, little teeny beanie hat on the head. And we're walking along and we're looking at produce and this woman goes, oh my goodness, he is so precious. And she reaches in like she's gonna pick him up and my wife slaps this lady's hand and the lady goes, oh, and she goes, oh my goodness, I am so sorry, I've never done that before. That happened so many times. He was the most beautiful, charismatic, charming baby in the world. And at 18 months, we found out he didn't have good vision and we gave him glasses. Do you know how stinking cute a baby with little round glasses that wrap around? Oh my goodness. And it makes his eyes all big and he's like, you know, like a cartoon. He was just adorable. Yes, so. My dad was talking to 330 million people every week on the radio at that time. That means every four months he spoke to the equivalent of the entire population of the world. And every one of those people in my head believes I have to be a perfect parent. And if I'm not, they're going to stop listening to my dad. And they don't listen to my dad, they're not going to hear about Jesus because he talks about Jesus. So if they don't hear about Jesus, they're going to go to hell. And then the entire world is going to go to hell. And it's all going to be my fault because I'm a bad dad. And I became a wretched dad. I got a little video of my son with his glasses on counting to ten. He goes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. And I go, oh, buddy, it's seven, eight, nine, ten. Seven, eight, nine, ten. And he goes, binky, because he wants his passy. And I go, one more time. And he goes, binky. And I go, one more time. Count to ten, one more time. I'm videoing you. I'm videoing you. It's going to be perfect. One more time. Binky, one more time. He starts crying. What did I do? I kept withholding his binky, trying to get him to do what I wanted him to do so that I could be a perfect dad and the whole world wouldn't go to hell and it wouldn't be my fault. I pushed him away so fast. I pushed my daughter away. I pushed my wife away. And I knew it. I was on the radio with my dad telling people how to raise kids and have a good marriage, and I had a terrible marriage, and my kids hated me. I was a fraud. Didn't know what to do. The Lord woke me up in the middle of the night, one in the morning. And by this time, my daughter is three. I have spanked my son. I regret it every time. I've not spanked her, and I knew I never could. Because I found out at a very young age, Lucy was stronger than me. She's tougher than me. She's a stronger resolve than I do. And I didn't know what to do about it. If she disagreed with anything that I did, or if I told her to correct anything at all, she just set the house on fire. Like, I'm not kidding. She would go from one to a thousand like that. Like, if I escalated, like, just a little escalation, she's pulling the pen on the grenade and just tossing it. Like, what? What now? What now? What? What? Oh, dynamite too. Psh, psh, what now? What? Paint. Psh, what now? I mean, she was insane. She was just, she would just scream. She would be so angry. And I did what all these Christian white parents do, right? What do you do when your child doesn't behave? You treat him like a puppy. How do you get a puppy to behave? You stand up tall, you puff your chest out, you get your deep voice low, and then you start talking really loud. I'm big daddy. You should do what I'm telling you to do because I'm the right guy. And God's given me this ability to parent you, and I got to tell you what to do. Because I'm a big dad. Why do I have to do what you do? Because I'm a parent and I told you to do it. That's why. Anybody ever heard that? Felt that? I was doing that to my kid all the time. I did that with Lucy. If I, if I deepened my voice and got a little bit loud, that was it. That was it. I lost immediately. She was setting the house on fire and it was like, what do I do? What do I do? 
And I remember asking the Lord one in the morning, Lord, I am a fraud. I'm telling people how to raise children and my kids hate me. You know what he told me? He said, Ryan, I want you to do the exact opposite of what you think is right. I was like, what? He goes, everything that you think you should do as a parent, I want you to stop doing and do the opposite of that. I did not have any idea what he was talking about, except now I have a thing that I do with kids. Lucy's 11. She didn't need, I mean, sometimes she does because who cares? She's emotional. She's a kid. That's what she is. When she would get upset, I didn't know why. Now, here's the truth. I want her to not be upset. That's it. I just don't want her to be upset. What's the number one thing we say to little girls? It's four words. The number one thing we say to little girls growing up. It's okay. Don't cry. It's okay. Don't cry. It's okay. Don't. Who's heard that? Girls. Eight billion times? It's okay. Don't cry. It's okay. Don't cry. I was saying that to Lucy one day. My wife looked at me. She goes, stop saying that. You cry all the time. Nobody tells you to stop. It's true. I was like, wait, what? Hey, you know what it was? I was uncomfortable with her emotions. That's it. Totally uncomfortable with her emotions. I didn't know how to handle it. It made me uncomfortable. So when she gets upset, I do this. And I drop my shoulders. I don't even go upright. I don't even reach out. It's too aggressive. I step back and I go, oh, baby, what's up? Lou, what's going on? What can daddy do? I'm here. Anything you need, daddy's here. What do you need? What do you need? I use my voice as a calming tool with her. What do you need? Talk real soft. I have the sweetest, kindest, gentlest kid in the entire world. I don't know what strong-willed is. No idea. Do you know what's so funny about strong-willed kids? If you stop fighting with them, they got nobody to fight with. He taught me to be a good parent. He taught me to look at my kids for who they are. The Lord allowed me. You have no idea how desperate parents are to be good parents. You've got no idea how scary it is to be your parent. I'm going to tell you a secret, man. We fake it so much, and we never tell you. Because we've never been in the situation. I've never been a parent of a 16-year-old boy ever before in my life. It's my very first time. I've never experienced it. It's all theory. And when you try to practice it, most of your theories don't work at all. And you're like, what do I do? And we're so afraid for you, right? Because we saw you when you were teeny. He was a little teeny baby. He was so little. And he wanted to be swaddled. I'd have to wrap him up like a baby burrito. And if he got one arm out, he would cry. And I'd have to put him back in and then wrap him really tight. And I would hold him. And I would talk to him. And now he's big. He's bigger than me. He's six feet tall. And he likes girls. I'm so afraid. What happens if a girl breaks his heart? It's going to happen. He's going to get his heart broken by somebody. It happens to everybody. And I will be so sad. And I will want to hurt her. And I can't do that. And my wife will want to too. And I will let her if she wants to. <laughs> I'm so scared. He's going to be 18 in two years. He could leave the house. He's going to be an adult. What's he going to do? He's going to move away. I don't want him to move away. I love my kid. The Lord gave me something I didn't know I could ever have. He gave me a good marriage and a good family. I'm telling you, it's the greatest experience in the entire world. Listen, you want to know the truth? Here's, I'm going to give you truth that you're going to understand 100%. Okay? At your age, you'll understand this. When you're married, if you've got a loving wife and kids that like and love, love is a choice. Do you understand that? Love is a choice. Like is not a choice. Right? Sometimes you love your siblings, sometimes you don't love your siblings, sometimes you like them, most of the time you probably don't, right? Who knows? Shoot, I just lost it. What was I saying? Hit me. Siblings. Yes. When you're married, wait. Uh... No, I know. I'm going to get it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Who yelled? What is it? Hmm. All right, I'm going to get it. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Oh, yeah, he gave me a family. I didn't know I could have a family like this. I didn't know I could have a family that loves me. And you can't experience it, you don't even know. Like, you want to be a good parent, and you want your children to like you, and you want to have a good relationship with them, and you're trying to get there, and the Lord gave that to me. It's the greatest gift in the entire world. This is what I was going to tell you. Oh, I'm so happy now. I've remembered it. Woo! You can, and now when COVID, oh, thank you. It's the Lord gave it back to me. I'm so happy. Okay. No, no, no. I've only had two minutes left. Stop, 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 stop. Two minutes. It's just two minutes. And I'm going to go over a little bit. I can already tell. So when COVID hit three years ago, March 14th, three years ago, 
I lost my job because I was a contract worker. I lost all my work. All my speaking events got canceled. I lost my entire income in one day. I was in the parking lot of an ophthalmologist buying three pairs of prescription glasses. You don't even care about that, but the adults in here are like, oh my goodness, right? I just bought three pairs of prescription glasses to their bifocals, uh, and I just lost my job. Here's the truth. You can be totally broke. I mean, broke as a joke. No idea how you're going to pay your bills. If your wife loves you and your kids love you and like you, it's really not that big of a deal. I'm telling you, it's really not that big of a deal. And listen to this. Are you looking up here? You can be the most famous person in the world. You can be the most successful person in the world. You can be wealthier beyond your wildest imagination. You can have every single thing you've ever desired in your entire life. You can be on a stage be getting ready to be given the, the, the greatest award you could ever be given. But if your wife and you are disagreeing and not getting along and you feel horrible about your marriage, you might walk up on that stage and slap one of your friends in the face. Yeah. You know Will Smith? <laughs> uh, and this is not a joke. Listen, stop, stop for a second, honestly. Listen to this. Do you have any idea how bad his marriage, at least at that time, was? I mean, think about this. As a man, he felt so small, so belittled, so powerless, so emasculated that on his greatest night, when the whole entire world is watching, all he wanted to do when he woke up that morning was celebrate this great achievement. But he was not enjoying himself at his party. He was not enjoying himself getting ready to receive his award. He was not enjoying himself because he's sitting with a woman that he's not getting along with that he's married to, who has had an affair, who's talked about it openly. The whole world knows your business. He was so emasculated and so ashamed of his marriage that instead of receiving this great achievement and celebrating with his family and friends, instead, he slapped his best friend in the face and got banned from the Oscars for a decade. My goodness, you think it was bad when Chris Rock made one joke about Jada and you do this and every comedian on the entire world is talking about your wife. Every news person, everybody you know is talking about your marriage. It was the opposite of what he wanted. That is what a bad marriage does to you. But a good one? Oh, baby. A good one's the greatest. Okay, last thing. The Lord loves you in ways you've never even dreamt. Never even dreamt. There's a thing in Colorado called the Great Sand Dunes. They're giant mountains of sand. And that's crazy. You can snowboard down it. Uh, it's banana. You can sled down it. It's like snow, but it's, it's like 110 degrees. And you're just like, you know, sand in your face the whole day. It's kind of fun. But it's exhausting. We went to the Great Sand Dunes. So my 16-year-old and my wife did not want to climb the sand dunes, but my 10-year-old daughter definitely wanted to climb all the way to the top of the sand dunes. So guess who got to climb the top of the sand dunes? This guy. So we do it. And it took all day. And it was... It was pretty fun, it was. We had a pretty good time, but it was exhausting. Finally, we're coming our way down, we cross this river, and we're getting ready to walk up the hill, and Lucy turns around and she goes, oh, Daddy! And I go, what? She goes, look, look! And I turned around, the sun had changed, and the dunes took on this glow, and this, I, it's indescribable. There's like this iridescent, you know uh, when uh, the plankton gets luminescent, and you see the wave, and there's like this iridescent thing on the top of it, but not the entire thing? It was doing that. It was sparkling and shining. It was the craziest thing in the world. And she was, I could see the joy in her face. She was overwhelmed with this joy. And I was like, oh, baby, I got something to tell you that you're not going to believe. And she was like, what? I'm like, you know we believe in Jesus, right? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, we think, say, all good things come from God, right? And she was, yes. I'm like, listen, honey, I'm going to tell you how much the Lord loves you. In Genesis 1, when it says, God created the heavens and the earth. Earth was without form and it was void. And he took the light and the darkness and he separated it. He took the void and he formed into the earth. 
right? And she was like, yes. I'm like, that instant when everything came together for the very first time. In that moment, Lucy, the Lord already knew we'd be standing here right now today. He knew how much joy this would bring you. And I'm telling you, from the instant of creation of earth, he directed time and space all to this one instant right here that you would turn around and go, oh, it's so pretty. The Lord did that for you. You know, the Lord does that for you every single day, every single good thing. Anytime you feel joy, if a song brings your heart up and you go, oh, Oh, you feel that goodness inside of you. Every single time the Lord designed that from the beginning of time. That was not an accident. It didn't just happen. He didn't go, oh, hey, you need a little feeling good. Here. He knew it so long ago. Before he sent his son to die for you, he created situations to bring you joy. That is how much God loves you. No matter where you are, no matter what you're into, God's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. He's not upset with you. He is desperate to be in a relationship with you you. Can I do five more minutes? Or is that too much? Are you sure? Is that okay? You have lunch. You tell me. Okay. 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 All right. Last thing. Last thing. Last thing. Now here's the truth. Most of you aren't going to get this. It's okay. But the ones that do, this is going to change your life forever. It will change your life forever. And again, I'm going to tell you how much the Lord loves you in a special way. So I believe in kindness, 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 be kind to everyone, be kind all the time. When you have a server in a restaurant and they have a name tag, call that person by their name. Say thank you. Say please when you order. Please, thank you, excuse me. Be kind. It will change everything about your life. You have no idea because nobody is thanked for their job. Nobody. I found this out. It's the craziest. I was in Nashville. I met some guy that knew a guy that worked for my dad that I don't like. I'm sorry. We don't get along that well. Our personalities just don't mix. But this guy that I meet, this random stranger is like, do you know this guy? And I'm like, yeah. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, I know that guy. I don't like him. And he's like, oh, man. He starts telling me how great this guy is to work with. And I'm like, what? This guy I don't like? Like, he calls back on time. He's super prompt. And he's totally encouraging. Like, he's really good. And this guy's just going on and on and on. I was like, wow, okay. Lo and behold, two weeks later, I'm at a wedding sitting at this guy's table. I didn't want to be there. I didn't even like this guy that much. He's there with his wife. You know what I did? I was like, hey, Cheryl, you know something? I heard something about your husband last week. I see the look on his face. It was like deer in headlights because he knows we don't get along that well. I go, I met this stranger. We were out. I was with a bunch of friends. Some guy introduced me to this guy, and he's like, oh, you're James Hobson's son, right? And I'm like, oh, yes. He goes, do you know so-and-so? Her husband. And I'm like, yes. And I go, he went on and on and on about how great it is to work with your husband. He said he calls back all the time. He's super prompt. He's encouraging. He understands. They went on and on. I, I just met this guy. All he wanted to do was tell me how great it is to work with your husband. The guy wrote me the next day. He said it's literally never happened one time in his entire life. He's almost 60. Never one time has anyone ever told his wife that he does a good job at work. Women, do you understand what I'm telling you? You don't get it. Some of you are going to get it. When you appreciate the man that you end up with and you let him know you appreciate him, he will go to war for you. I'm telling you, he will. It's the craziest, craziest thing. Be kind. Here's the other thing that happens when you're kind. And this is how God designed it. When you are kind to a person, like, uh, oh, I saw a guy backing a semi into a space. Like, have you ever seen someone back up a semi? Like, it's the craziest thing in the world. I don't even know how you do it. Like, how do you see back there? There's no cameras, and this guy is doing it fast. Like, he's pulling it around, and he's like, bum, bum, like, and it's doing this whole thing. I drove a mini semi one time. I can't back it up 10 feet. I hit something in 10 feet. This guy was like, bum, 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 and I'm watching it like, that's crazy. He gets out of his truck. I'm like, dude, that was amazing. I've never seen anything like it. And he was like, mm, all right. Yeah. He was stoked. When someone smiles at you when you're kind to them, do you know what happens in your brain? You get a hit of dopamine. You know what dopamine does? It's really interesting. Who loves chocolate? Who can't live without it? Okay, so those that don't, you don't understand this, but chocoholic people that just can't, just can't live without it, this is what their brain does. This is what dopamine does. They start to take a bite and the dopamine hit hits. It's not, the first thing they think isn't, oh, it tastes so good. The first thing dopamine tells your brain is, you should do this again. Which is why, if you know someone that just can't live without chocolate, when they're eating it, they're often reaching for another piece at the same time. 
They're not even enjoying this one as much as they could because their brain is going, get another one, get another one, get another one, right? So when you go up to the supermarket and the lady behind the counter, you're like, oh, hey, Gloria, it's good to see you. You know, I do this. There's a woman named Joyce at my Costco and she won't talk to me and she won't smile at me and it drives me crazy. And so for two years, two years, I have been kind to this woman because I am determined to make a friend out of her. I say hi, Joyce, every time, and she gives me a scowl. Every time, I bring my redheaded daughter with me. She's so cute, she scowls at me anyway. Last week, I'm leaving Costco. Joyce is checking out. I know I'm gonna get up to her. And she has a Columbia jacket on that's camouflage. My favorite color is camouflage. I can't live without camouflage. And we're getting out, I go, hey, Joyce, and she goes, hi. And I go, that jacket is so beautiful. You didn't get that here, did you? And she perked up, and she goes, oh, my husband bought this for me. And I go, oh, your husband has great taste. Oh, guess who that made a friend? Me. <laughs> now, what is dopamine telling me to do? You should do it again. You become addicted to kindness. And then more people smile at you. More people smile. By the way, as a, as a, as a young person, this is something that's gonna change your life. If you can do this with adults, your life will be smoother than all of your friends because when you're kind to adults, when you appreciate an adult, you're gonna be the rarest child in their life. No kid has ever said thank you for doing their job. They're gonna look at you and want to invest more in you. That's the other way God loves you. He's designed your body so that when you do the thing that he wants you to do, when you are kind to strangers, when you love the unloved, when you help the needy, he gives you this crazy chemical hit. He designed science in a way that makes you want to do it again and again. That is the true power of Christianity. That is who people should see you as. Man, those kids are so kind. Every time they come to a restaurant, they tip, they tip by the way, tip well. Everyone knows you're a Christian. Don't be cheap. Those waiters and waitresses, man, they are busting their rears trying to make a living. Be nice, be kind, say thank you. And when they ask you why you're so kind, because they will. I'm telling you, it happens all the time. Why are you kind? Why are you nice to me? Why are you saying that to me? I go, oh, man. Jesus loves me, and I just want everyone to know how much he loves them, too. And you get to be that person. And you'll see the change in their face, and they go, oh. and they start thinking about God in a brand new way because of your kindness. Lord, thank you. Thank you for letting me be here today. Oh my goodness, I've been waiting for this day for so long. What an honor. Lord, I want you to bless these children. I know I shouldn't say children. Bless these young adults, Lord. They're going to be adults. They're going to go into the world. They're going to lead our country into its next phase. Bless them, Lord. Let them know that you're there every step of the way. Create that journey from the head to the heart to know that you're around them at every second. Thank you for every good thing, Jesus. In your name, amen. Thank you so much, y'all. I'll stick around. If you want to talk, I'll be here. Ryan, thank you so much. Like Ryan said, he'll be back for a few minutes. If anybody has questions, comments, anything you want to talk about, he'll be here. I know you have questions. You say, what do we do next? It's time to stop listening and time to start living it. Right? You with me? You ready, Tucker? Man, y'all have, uh, y'all got rainy day lunch. Let's see. Um, seniors, if you're a senior, say yeah. yeah. Somebody's confused saying no. Um, Y'all are going to hang back and connect with Mrs. Breeden. She's got big plans for you. Um, and then uh, let's see. Yeah, rainy day lunch. That means once, uh, once we dismiss here in just a second, you will go to your seventh period class. Hey, Please don't do this thing where we, we go, hey, we just listen to it and we live life exactly the same. Middle school, are you with me? Don't do that. High school, are you with me? Don't do that. Be a friend that speaks truth and go to youth group tonight. Y'all are dismissed. <laughs>